but I always think of this happiness thing as like you're you're trying to push yourself and be uncomfortable, but everything about you innately you you're trying to be comfortable like that's like just your biological processes go to safety, preserve your body, be safe like that's you know it's like a self preservation but the only way you expand in any way is to get out of that comfort zone. So it's like, you're kind of like always sort of fighting against what your body's naturally telling you to do. Yeah. And I think it's from, so for instance, you know, there's evidence that the human beings have been around for a quarter of a million years. Right. So only in the last, what, hundred years. So in the last hundred years is when we've gotten to a place where we're essentially comfortable. Like we're not, you know, trying to outrun lions. We're not trying to, you know, forage for food. We're not, you know, we have electricity, we have indoor plumbing. We have, we know what certain diseases are like we're relative, we're the safest we've ever been. Right. Hmm. But there's evidence that we're also the most fearful that we've ever been. That's interesting. Welcome to Confessions of a Financial Advisor, the antidote to conventional financial wisdom. My name is Al, and I've been a financial advisor for over 20 years. This podcast will explore the emotional and psychological factors that affect our behaviors. All of the other financial podcasts out there will talk about the numbers and the math. We will confront the stories that we all fuse with that ultimately set the course for our lives. I am not looking for new clients and have no intention on running for any kind of office. I'm going to tell you like it is and call out all the commonplace BS. Now, let's get into confessions of a financial advisor. Okay, we are live for... An episode number 31 with Prison and the Abyss of Choice. Yes. Hey, Diane. Hey, Al. How's it going over there? Great. How are you doing? That's good. That's good. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So, yeah, Prison and the Abyss of Choice. Prison. It's a metaphorical prison, obviously. The prisons that we keep ourselves in. And so the one thing that brought this topic to the blog... The reason why I wanted to talk about it was I spent, well, I spent many years in corporate America, but the last five years of corporate America, I was having conversations literally daily with a coworker and we would go have coffee every single day Mm -hmm. and we would just literally convince each other that we can leave. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, he would say to me, Al, if you left tomorrow Within three months, you would be up and running. You'd be good to go. You'd probably even be better off than where you're at right now financially. And you'd have no boss. Yeah. You'd be independent. Yep. And then I would say the same thing to him. because I, And I would really believe it. I'd look at it. I'd be like, yeah, absolutely. You can do this. And so we'd do this daily. And, you know, in a million different ways. And we'd even like laugh about it. We'd be like, this is ridiculous. We talk about the same thing every time we have coffee. And so neither one of us left. Two years later, after having those conversations, or whatever, many years later, after having conversations, neither one of us pulled the trigger to go independent. So we had to deal with freaking sales management, corporate America, all the bullshit that goes along with corporate America. We just swallowed it and just said, yeah, whatever. I guess we'll just tolerate this because I'm comfortable like a cow in the rain, stoic cow. (laughs) And so what happened was he got laid off. And then six months later, I got laid off. Yeah. It was like we got kicked from the nest. And we both... Shoved out of the nest. Shoved. Like boot. Like a boot right in the butt. Like didn't know it was coming. Had no idea. It was just sort of like, all right, now you're on your own. Now figure it out. So he figured it out. And then I figured it out. And we're both like to this day, we're in touch and we talk a lot and we laugh about it. You know, like... And we literally laugh about the idea that if we didn't get kicked out, we'd still be sitting there having coffee, talking about this, of leaving. Yeah. And it's just because like, you have this comfort level. He just had a consistent income and it was just comfortable. Like, And the outside just seemed daunting. And there was so many different... Again, the abyss of choice, meaning there were so many things that could have possibly went wrong that your mind would conjure up. 
What if I, you know, what if my clients don't follow me? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if I lose my license? What if I get, uh, you know, it, it went, it could go in a million different storylines. The abyss of possibility and the darkness of the unpredictability of that. Yeah. It's terrifying. It's terrifying. It's just one of those that you know what you have. You don't know what you're getting into. And you could, I mean, you can prepare, you know, again, we prepared too. like, you know, we would just constantly have like lists of our clients that we updated consistently and made sure that we were calling everybody. And we did all these things. We did, you know, all of the training or for lack of a better word to like prepare ourselves for the jump, but then wouldn't jump. Needed the kick, needed the kick in the ass. Yeah. So I always like wondered, I'm like, could I have intentionally jumped? Obviously I could have. I mean, it's not like it was physically impossible, but for whatever reason, I had that mental block of, ah, I can't, if I jump and I fail and like literally I'm here and I drop down like real low and I have a low income again and I have to be struggling to get new clients and I have to go back to prospecting. I was like, I don't know. Obviously I could do it. I've already done it once, but it just didn't seem worth the risk. Yeah. But looking back, I can't imagine if I spent the last seven years in corporate America with the same, you know, stupid in retrospect. Corporate, yeah. In retrospect. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Real easy. Oh, how many of us look back in retrospect and just go, oh, I wish I was shoved sooner. Yeah. Just booted. I mean, I think about it with swimming with a little kid too. Like, I mean, it sounds so mean, but if you th- just throw a kid, just throw a kid in the just throw a kid in the deep end, they're gonna learn how to swim pretty damn quick. They'll be scared, and then like it'll just—it's kind of like uh, what do they call it? Like you know, throwing you to the wolves or trial by fire. Like yeah, trial by fire. I think is the. I mean, it's not fun, but it's damn. It's the fastest way to learn, right? It's like you get thrown in. But nobody will intend figure it out. Yeah, but that's the whole idea. So the, it's it's contrary to intentionally doing anything because you're getting th- <laughs> somebody's throwing you. You're not throwing yourself. Yeah, it's <laughs> like not even thrown, just shoved. Shoved, right? Yeah, at the edge of the pool, and somebody's just like, bam! Nothing you can do. You're falling in the water. I just spun that in my head, and I'm like, in how many different ways in my life am I doing that? Where I'm not jumping where I should be. It's not like you should just be jumping at everything, but like places where you know that this is going to benefit my life and this is going to be... The dark places that you don't want to go. Right. Yep. The dark places that we resist. We talked also in this post about hypothesizing and just trying to talk through and trying to find evidence and just preparing. All of this stuff. And we do it in relation to like the little baby chick getting kicked from the nest, flying, right? So let's just relate to flying. So hypothesizing about flying, talking about flying, preparing for flying, none of it means that you can fly. Yeah. It's just a mental exercise. All of it's, I mean, maybe some of it has some use, but until you freaking jump and just do it, there's no way of knowing. You can't. No. You don't know how it feels until you actually do it. And that's why I think we're, we're so impressed in our culture by people that jump repeatedly. Yes. Yeah. Like, the, well, do, I mean, we did a freaking post on Tesla and freaking the Elon Musk. I mean, he just, the guy just sent two NASA astronauts into space. Did you see that at SpaceX? So my brother-in-law actually texted me. He's like, did you see what just happened? And I'm going, holy shit. Like, I yeah. was talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Jesus. I mean, he's got a freaking car company that's bigger than... Yeah. I mean, we've talked about him endlessly. I mean, to me, he's just a... He's an alien. He's a freak. I don't know how that guy just continually opens that box. He's an anomaly. An anomaly. Yes. There's a lot to be learned from that. And that's like... And he's... Yes. These are the people like in our culture that like we... People strive to be. People envy and look up to. And there's a good reason because like we know how difficult it is to be jumping consistently into the unknown. And we also all know that. And how uncomfortable it is. Yeah. And it is 
incredibly uncomfortable. And on the other side, how rewarding it can be, you know? Oh God, yes. Right? I mean, you, yeah. you think about it just the, in the small ways. Just think about like learning to swim, overcoming fears. Sharing your story. Yeah, and I think it's all, the story's all relative. So people look at me and I'm like, oh, Al, like you have a financial advisory practice, you do a podcast, you're in a band, you have a family. I'm like, how do you do all this stuff? And they think I'm the guy that's like constantly jumping, you know, because I'm doing different things. And <laughs> I'm like, holy shit, I don't feel that way about myself. You don't? You know what I mean? Like, I do a little bit. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Own it. I'm more focused on the shit I'm not doing, which is not a good way to live. Okay. First of all, I will tell you, <laughs> you have incredible insight that you are sharing that I am very proud of you for sharing. And I know this is going to make you very uncomfortable, but Uh-oh. you telling your stories is meaningful and it's powerful. And the world needs it. Mm. And I know that yeah. I know that you're not going to like that, but no, I do like that. I do. I really do. And I tell Shelby about this all the time. I tell her that this, the, the, the like kind of a similar conversation. She's like, well, maybe the reason why you're doing all these things is because you somewhat are focused on the things that you're not doing. So like you're focusing on the things you're not doing and you're like, you got to go do that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's, Again, it doesn't mean that it's comfortable. It's not. It's no, never it's comfortable. not comfortable. It's not at all comfortable, but it's meaningful. Yeah. And the world needs to hear more men telling their stories. The world needs yeah. more men speaking up and sharing their voices. You know that I'm very passionate about helping men tell their stories. And you're one of them. And... Yeah. Like by you even having this podcast, it is changing the world. Because it doesn't just need to be us women having conversation, but men need to join in the conversation as well. Yeah. So I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, this whole thing is about, yeah, breaking out of that metaphorical prison, you know, of just... Yes. Oh, the prison. Being in that box. And into the abyss. Into the abyss. <laughs> the unknown. Yeah. And I guess the real irony behind this post is that I'm looking for some sort of comfort in this, like by talking about it, that I'm going to alleviate the uneasiness and the, the stress and the anxiety and all the things that go along with jumping into the abyss. But that's, that's, the whole point is like the whole point of going into the abyss is that you're going to have all that anxiety and fear and it just goes along with it. It just goes yep. with it. Sorry. It's like they go hand in hands. Yep. And that's, it's the weird kind of, again, dichotomies, you know, we have these like dichotomies where we're searching. <laughs> the juxtaposition. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was watching, you ever hear of Dan Gilbert? Dan Gilbert is the guy that uh, stumbling upon happiness I haven't, or stumbling on happiness. No, I haven't seen that. He's like a Harvard professor, I think. And uh, he did this Ted talk or it was on YouTube and he talks about the different happiness levels mm. of people. So he's judging happiness and like the lowest is basically when people, what he says are resting or like when you're trying to like get to a point where, you know, we have this picture in our head of retirements of like sitting back, doing nothing, having no obligations. He's saying that that's like the lowest on the scale Level of happiness. Level of satisfaction? Yes. And I think he said, I'm probably going to butcher this, but the highest levels are, are more like talking with people, being productive. Like we always think that we, we want to stop doing things, but it's not true. Our, our happiness comes from doing things. Yeah. It's not that you don't want to be in motion. It's just you don't want to deal with all the bullshit that, you know, most of us deal with in life, which usually come from other people. Ooh. <laughs> other people. Yeah. The happiness thing. Mm -hmm. But I always think of this happiness thing as like, you're, you're trying to push yourself and be uncomfortable, but everything about you innately, you, you're trying to be comfortable. Like that's like just your biological processes go to safety 
preserve your body, be safe. Like that's, you know, it's like a self-preservation, but the only way you expand in any way is to get out of that comfort zone. So it's like, you're kind of like always sort of fighting against what your body's naturally telling you to do. Yeah. And I think it's from, so for instance, you know, there's evidence that the human beings have been around for a quarter of a million years, right? So only in the last, what, hundred years? So in the last hundred years is when we've gotten to a place where we're essentially comfortable. Like we're not, you know, trying to outrun lions. We're not trying to, you know, forage for food. We're not, you know, we have electricity, we have indoor plumbing. We have, we know what certain diseases are like we're relative, we're the safest we've ever been. Right. Hmm. But there's evidence that we're also the most fearful that we've ever been. That's interesting. Yeah. Because I mean, when you're in survival mode, think about people like in the 1800s that, you know, say you, you worked on a farm, you're working all day on a farm yeah, and your whole life is just about work and surviving. Right. And then it just progressively, what we're doing is we're progressively getting more and more comfortable, more and more sheltered, more and more conveniences, more and more luxuries. But I, th- I don't know if that's such a good thing because what seems to be happening is that we're giving ourselves more time to be like creating, hmm. you know, illusory problems or things that, you know, we're just conjuring problems out of thin air. And that's the prison. So I think the prison becomes your minds. Your mind is the prison. You and I have talked about everything <laughs> is a mind fuck. Everything. Yeah. And you call in this post, I was reading it because I haven't read it in a while, where you were saying fear is the insidious monster. Yeah. It exists in our minds. It's a mental construct. Yeah, it's like always there. It's We torture ourselves with. We've talked about, you know, people being put on quarantine. Like, mm-hmm. sit with your thoughts. See how that works for you. Yeah, Ugh. it's not working out well for many of us because people don't want to sit with their thoughts. And yeah. my mind is a, a very, very, very dark place. You don't want to be inside my mind. You just don't. It's good luck with that. I mean, at times, though, I see that at times, but I think you have a lighter side, too. It's like you have everything in there. It's not just the dark. It's right. I mean, a lot of times, maybe that's what we focus on. Mm. And so and it's a scary place to be. I don't think it's like yeah. that, all the. I know what you mean, it's though. It's dark place. So, <laughs> I'm not going to argue. OK. I like first one to beat myself up Mm -hmm. you know and I am my most brutal critic and I will admit that you know other people will be like well we'll give me accolades and whatever and I'm like okay yeah but I'm my mind is where I beat myself up and I think a lot of us are guilty of that and you just gave me a compliment earlier and (laughs) And again, it's like, I don't see it that way. I beat myself up too. I don't, it's not that I don't think this podcast is important. I don't, it's not that I don't think men telling their stories is, you know, I don't, I don't, it's not that I believe that that's not important. It's just when I look at myself, I look at the things that I'm not doing. It's again, it's like the whole looking forward as opposed to looking back. A lot of times it's a lot better for your psyche to look back and see. Mm-hmm we kind of see the mountain in front of us and we don't see like how much we've climbed by looking yeah. back. So you don't give ourselves any credit and you just yeah. you wear yourself out. And even reflecting. And so that actually, I was just journaling about that this morning for myself, reflecting about giving myself credit mm. for how far I've come. Yeah. Cause I was called out on that bullshit on Sunday. Yeah. So, yeah, that was fun. I want you to expand on that. You haven't told me much about what she called you out on. Oh, God. (laughs) Fuck. (laughs) I'm going to share this. Um, So I actually allowed myself to feel a lot of feelings the past week. Witnessing 
the local news and witnessing my own feelings and just allowing myself, fuck, <laughs> cry. And witnessing and just allowing myself to feel the shit that was coming up because it's been a lot this past week. And giving myself that space is huge for me because a year ago I would have been work, 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 just keep working. Ex- external work. And yes, yeah. productive. And this year I actually allowed myself to feel some really, really hard emotions that were coming up and and witness some things that were awful. Yeah, and we're talking on June 9th. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's during the there's, you know, there's been a lot of um, riots and protests and, and yeah, just shit happening. Violence and looting and anger. Yeah. Like public anger and Yeah. I feel I feel it too. I mean, I I know everybody feels it. You can't watch this stuff and not feel that. It's like, I live in Charlotte, and Charlotte as a city has a very violent energy to it. And I haven't been immediately touched by the violence, but like I'm watching it on the news, and I'm going what the fuck is happening like in our city? It's, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to watch it. Well, I think you're, you're like me in a way that I try to see the world as a place that's evolving in a good way that, you know, we're coming to like a higher consciousness as like a society as, and then when you see stuff like this, it's like, we just went back 50 years. Like what, what, what just happened? Why do we do that? Like, I thought yeah. we were better than that. I thought we, I thought we were going forward. Now we're past that. Yeah. Yeah. And so in so many ways, it feels like we're going backward. Yeah. And I fight to like, I don't want to believe that. Like, I, I can't believe that. Like that's, but it's hard not to believe it when it's in your face and you're seeing violence and you're seeing freaking bozo in office, you know, saying stupid shit. And- well, the violent aspect gets to me more than I think anything just having been on the receiving end of violent behavior. uh, I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, you can't do that. Right. You can't do that to other people. Because you're mad? Because you're angry? Like, so you, exactly. Like, (sighs) yeah. I, I, the, the thing that bugged me out this time around was that people seem to be celebrating the violence. I mean, they're free because everything's on camera now. Everybody's freaking taking video of everything. Oh, everything's being recorded. Oh, and people are giving like high fives as they're like looting place. I'm like, you're proud. You're on camera. Yeah. All right. You're just, okay. Yeah. Smile. You know? Oh. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Yeah. So So the (laughs) idea of like being trapped in your head, but it does go back to that whole prison of your head because like. And it's funny for me personally, I, with this particular post, I come to it from a place of, as someone who has opened two businesses, like, oh, from prison to the abyss. Yeah. Like literally just jump twice. Yeah. And with no idea of where the net might be. But having some sort of faith that there's some sort of net, yes. right? That there's something, there's no, it, yes. the abyss isn't really the abyss. The abyss mm-hmm. has some sort of bottom. Mm-hmm. You know, there's something that kind of sustains us. You know, there's something that's some sort we're of not going to fall off. Yeah. Like we're not just a free, it's not a free fall. It's a fall, <laughs> but, but it's not it's an, an endless, it's not an endless free fall. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think we both have some sort of faith in that. Yeah. And if you don't, I mean, then you'll, ne- I mean, I, I don't think you could ever make any type of quote unquote Jump. risky jumps. Yeah. Even 
And when it comes to like bring it to relationships, like how do you know that that person's right for you? You don't. No. But there's a level of trust in jumping. I mean, and that never ends in the relationship. Just because you get married, I think a lot of people think that once they get married, they have this contract and that contract will hold things together. (laughs) Good luck (laughs) with that. But again, like, so think about it. Like you, you meet somebody, you decide you're both into each other. You decide you want to live together. Five years in, you're not looking at each other maybe the same way. Yeah. And then you start convincing yourself this isn't the right person or. Yeah. It's an ongoing choice. It's an ongoing choice. It's a daily choice. It can be a daily choice. Yeah. I think in some ways when you meet like the right, like having a child's gave me the perspective of like, well, I already knew it with my mom, but like an un- unconditional kind of love. And you don't usually find that unconditional kind of relationship in a person that you're in a romantic relationship with, at least the, in my, it hasn't happened that way Yeah, where it's that unconditional love. It's a little bit more of a judgy type love, you know, <laughs> like you got to do your shit and I got to do my shit. And like, you know, like the way I'm M with my daughter is a different, type of dynamic where I'm like, you know, I just, I'm going to tell her when she's wrong. I'm going to do all that. But like, I, there's this weird kind of like, Jesus Christ, she's got like me wrapped around her finger and she doesn't, you know, like, or it's just, how do I describe it? And I guess I'm always looking for it, like in that romantic relationship, but it's, it doesn't work that way. And, but I had that relationship with my mom, which is strange because it's weird. It's like, she basically just told me, she literally like just told me one day, I don't know, I think I was 18 or something. I was upset about something. And she said, she's like, I'm the only person in this world that is looking out 100% for your best interests. Only person in this world, 100% for your best interests. And I believed it. And I was like, from that point on, our relationship changed and like never got into an argument with my mom. I never got into any... We were just good. We were golden from that moment on. There was honestly, there wasn't one. I never had a fight with her, never lost contact, always was in touch with her. Mm. And it was the only time I felt that. And like, I, this is, and this kind of goes back to that whole idea that I, I always tell you that she wasn't a person that spoke yeah. like the I love yous. And she didn't, it wasn't like this wordy kind of thing. So for her to say that, I was like, that's true because she doesn't say shit. So she said it and I'm like, wow. All right. So that's the way it is going forward. Yeah. How do we get there? Get all caught up with these stories. Um, the relationship thing. I think we were just got, it was back to the whole idea of relationships and making the choice. And yeah, I mean, but you have, so for instance, like you have friends, right. That you choose mm-hmm. that you could pretty much tell I mean, shit would have to get real, real bad for you not to be friends with them. Yeah. Right? I mean, like, you're going to be friends with them regardless. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you know them well enough, like, unless they, you know, did something horrendous. Like, you're going to be friends with Outrageous. Yeah. Outrageous. So you've made that decision, right? So why is that decision different for friends than it is for, like, a romantic relationship? Because there's more... I'm not in a romantic relationship so i, don't I know, know. Now we're, so we're talking about me now oh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> but don't you ever feel like the difference between a romantic relationship and the relationship you have with friends it's different and when you choose a friend it is different yeah it seems easier to stay friends in a long-term relationship yeah. with a friends than a long-term relationship with True. you know a romantic partner i would agree but I think part of that has to do with the 24-7 thing. The living together 24-7, not having separation. Well, I I don't really want to live with anybody else <laughs> ever again. <laughs> you don't think it's good for <laughs> <laughs> It's just different. It, yeah. I think there are levels to it. But I think you and I have talked about previously, you know, it being a choice. And it's a choice every day. 
And in, in some small way, smaller way, it's like jumping into the abyss every day. Cause like, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know. It's, they're a completely different. There's no net. They're a different person. Yeah. They're just jump. They got their world. You got your worlds. You can share things, but ultimately you're just separate people. Yeah. Yeah. And other people are other people and, you know, other people bring their own trauma and baggage and wounds to the relationship that like, and a lot of people are, show me what you got. Well, that's the other thing. A lot of people are so well-schooled at hiding those. Oh, I mean, they're just like, they got that social mask that, I mean, they'll carry that for years. Yeah. Everyone's got their own issues that we bring to the the connection and the partnership. It it doesn't matter what the relationship is. It doesn't matter. Like you and I have a relationship and I have relationships with so many other people. And we each bring our own shit. Yeah. Well, unpack it. Yeah. Well, I guess what it's the the abyss is also showing people your shit and just being like, "Here's my shit. Are you okay with it?" <laughs> <laughs> and you're like crossing your fingers and hoping, you know, that they are. And then you, I mean, when, and think about it. Like when somebody shows you their shit mm-hmm. and you're accepting of it, it forms yeah. a bond with that person. That's how bonds are formed, right? It's not that surfacey shit. It's when you're you put out your crap. Go deep. Yeah, go you're deep. Not or go going home. deep with it's me. Right. Like we're not gonna connect. It's, it's like the mental analogy. It's like the mental phrase as you know they say, "Go hard or go home." For like working out, it's like go deep or go home for like <laughs> <laughs> to build friendships and build like strong relationships. Again, it's all about that dichotomy. Yeah. I mean, it's the abyss is literally the unknown. It's the unknown. It's the uncharted territory. And if you weren't afraid of it, then it wouldn't be an abyss. So it's like, it's one of those things, like you're trying to be okay with the abyss, Mm. but by its nature, it's conjuring up fear. Yeah. So the abyss isn't isn't real. I mean, it's just, it's a projection. It's a... I mean, it just says what it is. Well, think about it. So if I look at you, like you say you, you came to me tomorrow and you said, Allison, you know, I'm going to sell my real estate business. I'm sick of doing that. I'm, I mean, you know, I'm sick of writing too. I think I'm just going to be a sculptor from now on. I just, you know, I read a book and now I'm into sculpting and I'm going to quit everything else. I would have, <laughs> yeah, I would tell you what I think. And I, I'd probably tell you to take some precaution but I also know that you're a very um, creative person. Like you're eventually going to make it work in some form. Yeah, maybe, you know, you're not going to live as comfortably as you live now. But I, ha- but I could look at you and say, yeah, you're a smart person. You, I'm sure you'll figure it out eventually. But if, you, if I had thought that way about myself, I'm like, I, what I think about is I think about all the thought processes over the course of those years that I'm trying to become a sculptor and how that's going to like, that's what I'm afraid of. I'm not afraid of like not having money. I'm afraid of what mm. my mind does when I don't have money. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not afraid of poverty. I'm not afraid of not eating. I'm afraid what my mind does when I don't have resources. So when I look at you or I look at any other friend and they tell me something that I would think is outrageous, I'm like, you fucking live once. Yeah. Why not? Go, go for it. You can always go back to real estate. Like, but like I think about it for myself. I'm like, no, you can't do that. Like everybody else can, you can't. <laughs> well, I, when we start, before we even start the podcast, yeah. we were talking a little bit. We always kind of do this kind of banter of like, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I tell you what men think and where men are coming from. And you say that, you know, a lot of times women are too. Yes. So in this society, men come from this place of like, we're judged, you know, predominantly on our productivity and our, wealth and our money and our, you know, how we can take care of other people with money. And like, we're judged on that kind of status or kind of like our place in the world, like our, the hierarchy that we're in, you know, the external, yeah, the external, right. Yeah. And mostly with jobs, careers, money, like in that realm. 
and we're so that's the standard we're kind of held to. So to be somebody that has some money and to like stop, stop that money flow to do something creative yeah. is probably one of the most fearful things a man, a man can do. And you were sharing with me, like, it's the same for women. It's no different. But I think men have almost like, I guess it's the same. Like, so women are judged on appearance and how they take care of others. Like men are judged on Mm -hmm. productivity Mm -hmm. and how they can provide. We have to be providers. You're the caretakers, right? Yeah. So it makes those like abyss type decisions like that much more gut wrenching. Because all you're thinking about it, like the last thing a man wants to do is to have that feeling of impotence in this world, not just sexual impotence, but like impotence that you can't function, you can't provide, you can't be an upstanding Mm -hmm. citizen that can produce and take care of their family and take care of the people around them. They feel, you know, like to feel overwhelmed by the world is one of the scariest feelings for a man. You know, when you feel like you're, you know, you're in a, say you're in a job and you're not making enough money and you can't provide for your family. Like that to me is I'd rather die than feel that. Like, I don't want to feel that. And they say that like men are more fearful of, again, having that, not being able to provide, not be able to produce, you know, being sick. I mean, oh my God, men being sick is like, it's like a fear, fear worse than death. And so I, I think maybe God, the same thing holds true for women. My heart is breaking for oh, okay. women in the world. Like, what the hell? <laughs> like, I thought women had it rough. <laughs> no, but you have the caretaker thing, which I don't have. So it's like, that's a whole... Oh, dear God. That's a whole different wow. thing. So I don't, yeah, I don't have that burden. Where am I on my own list? Mm. <laughs> I don't have that burden of like feeling like I need to take care of everybody. Like I... Yeah. It's different, I, but it's funny. It's like, we talk about this stuff. It, it's different, but it, it's coming from, or it's ending up in the same place. We're, at, we're hitting the same brick wall. Yeah. Like, you know, I've talked about this. Like men and women are coming from the opposite directions, but we're hitting the same brick wall. Yeah. Like, like both of us are just like, what the actual fuck, people? Yeah. Ugh. Like you, I think, we, yeah, we wind up coming to a place like where we, like you just said, like we're, we feel like, all right, you know what? It's okay to take care of yourself. It's okay to feel things. It's okay. Like, right. We're hitting that, that, that's the wall we're hitting. It's okay to have emotions. It's okay to actually have a down day. It's, it's okay to not be perfect, take care of yourself. And so that was what I was, what I was journaling about was me allowing myself to feel. I had a really hard emotional weekend. Yeah. It was a lot. It was more than I can explain in words. Mm-hmm. And, and that's okay. And that shit happens. Not all the time, but sometimes it does. It seems, to, yeah. I was, um, on a memorial for a friend who passed away. And it was a lot. And I actually had several friends text and reach out to me. They were like, are you okay? Yeah, I'm all right. A memorial that was online, a remote Yeah, it was online because we can't gather right now. So. That makes it even that much more fucked up. Yeah, it was totally fucked up. Um, yeah. Anyway. And coming off of four months of of pandemic to boot, right. I mean, just this so much turmoil Yeah, that's in your face from, uh, it's, it's it's not supposed to, things come in waves, right? Grief is a fucking bitch and I'm well acquainted with it. I'm like, I don't really need any more experience with grief. Yeah. Yeah, because the whole trauma thing that happened in March and then my friend passed away two days after my birthday. 20 fucking 20 has been a fucking yeah. year. Fast forward. Let's hit the fast forward button. I'm like, could you please, like, could we please go to 2021? 
but just think if you can get through this shit, <laughs> just think with, you know, <laughs> I, <sighs> Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway, allowing myself to feel, but also allowing myself and recognizing the fact that I did allow myself to feel those feelings is significant for me. I feel because I don't know that a year ago I would have given myself permission to do that. So hmm. it's kind of like sales, right? Like sales, like either like, you're making nothing or you got too much business. Like right now you're like, you have too much business and grief, you know, it's like, because it comes in waves. Like shit doesn't happen. Like like not linear. That's not the right word. It doesn't happen. Like even where it's just spread out perfectly through your life. No, it comes in fucking heavy freaking seasons of like hurricanes. And then, so yeah, I, we've both been through it. I mean, so like we've both had this year of like, you know, I started the year off with my mom passing away yeah. and then it's on, it's just like very turbulent. And I feel like I'm coming out on the other side of it, but you're like on the front end of it. So, I mean, it's, it's sort of happening to you now in the moment, like in, in real time. And it's almost like you get that feeling like, what the, what the fuck is next? Like what? What else? What the actual what else, fuck? What else you like, got? What the hell? Yeah. <laughs> you feel like, you know, remember like Lieutenant Dan and Forrest Gump? Yeah. When he goes yeah, and yeah. climbs up on the, the boat in that hurricane. Yeah. And he's like, that's all you got. Come on, bring it. So I feel like, I feel like Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> on the boat. Yeah. Yeah. So again, this is all about like the prison of your mind. The abyss is actually not as bad as it seems. Once you get in there, there's actually opportunity within it. Yeah, and they're self-imposed. I mean, you don't have metal bars around you. Well, you have the metal bars that you choose to keep around you. You do, and they're strong. And they can become stronger <laughs> if you don't do shit about it. You know, like if, if you don't fight against it, they just become like just stronger and stronger. Yeah. We only imprison ourselves. And that's the bottom line is that the, the underlying core of this whole post and this whole podcast is. Yeah. We only imprison ourselves. Because we do have like literally unlimited choices in this life. Yeah. I mean, you, you think of, you know, so what I've, what I've been watching recently of people that basically uproot their lives and they like go buy a sailboat and they start traveling around the world. Oh, yeah. Like, I love watching that stuff. Now I'm on to, I don't know, whatever's on YouTube about that, I'm all in. Anyway, yeah. So prison and the abyss of choice. Let's let's wrap it up, Diane. All right. So I don't know what we're going to talk about next week. I do, because you're the one who, like, came up with the idea. Judgment. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of ourselves and of others. Judgment. That's freaking... Kind of relevant. Yeah, let's work out that cable next week. Judgment of ourselves and others. I mean, obviously, everybody judges themselves. I mean, I always have this picture in my head, and I've probably said this before, but I have to say it again. Imagine you can spend your entire life, for instance, is there a child in your life, like a niece or nephew, that when you look at, like, you're just so, like, all about them, you know, and you're just kind of like, you want, you don't want nothing bad to happen to them. And if they were, like, in pain, you would help them. And you'd never, like, really be harsh with them or judgy. Do you have somebody like that? I have, yeah, I have several nieces and nephews that are all under three years old. So, so imagine like you had, you know, a niece or nephew that was Diane, right? And like you literally made this caricature of yourself and it was just you. And anytime like you talk to this person, uh huh, it was you. It was like the way we judge ourselves. If we could just take that out of us and just project it on this little person that we love. Or go back to the younger version of ourselves. Yes. Like the seven-year-old me. And I pick her up all the time. So I don't even remember where I I saw it somewhere again yesterday. I'm the one I've been waiting for. Mm. Like the child version of me has been waiting for me. And it's hard to remember that. Oh, God, fuck. Um, <laughs> you got the, you're the loving parent for like the, your child. This came up in the call with my business coach on Sunday. Yeah, I'm the one I've been waiting for. Yeah, 
I literally am the one my younger self has been waiting for. Yeah, we get to go back and like reparents, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm the only one that can give her the understanding and the appreciation that she's been waiting for. This is turning into a really intense therapy session for me. This is a good therapy (laughs) session. We needed it. That's good. Yeah. I literally am the one I've been waiting for. I can't change that. And if you could have that in the forefront of your mind, like most of the time, like if you could just remind yourself of that every day. Remember that? Yeah, remember. Like, because it's so far. I mean, I could write like probably, again, a bullet point list of five things or 10 things that if I just live by and reminded myself of those Mm -hmm. things each day, I would just have a better life. I mean, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. So let me ask you, like, do you think your child self is waiting for you? I just, I forget to do it. Like when I'm in that moment, I look at my child self and I'm like, oh yeah, man, you're, it's, you know what? All the things that you think are wrong with you, all the things that like you're judging yourself over. Yeah. That you think you're fucking up. Yeah, like you're not. Like, and I would never tell that little kid that he's fucking up, you know? But you're telling yourself that. Why? Because I'm an adult? Because I can take it? Because I'm an adult? I mean, I'm that little kid. You're 47. You are kind of old. (laughs) Yeah, I do have a gray beard. I get it. But you are. You're you're always the little kid. You're always that little kid. That's what nobody understands. Yeah. I think like we have these images of like old people when we're kids. And you just think of them as kind of like just old and codgers and you know yeah like right like oh they smell and you know (laughs) and then then you start becoming older and you're like i'm the same person right Uh, and i'm probably gonna be the same person 30 years from now strange like your body ages so you think your brain ages but it doesn't really age like it still thinks still you in there yeah yeah so follow us fa.confessions.com and please review and like and subscribe and share. And what else? Leave a comment. Leave, leave a comment. Suggestions for topics. Yeah, suggestions. That would be good too. We'll always look into that. I have friends that leave many suggestions. I think I have a lot of friends that are dying to be on this podcast. Oh, do you? Yeah. <laughs> Bring them on. Yeah? Yeah. All right. We got we got to weed them out. <laughs> Bunch of derelicts, you know. <laughs> no, it would be fun, actually. I want to get James Hollis on this podcast. Yeah, he'd be good James. Ho- I got to mm-hmm. get him on here. Somehow, I, I got to get finished that book. Yeah, did you? Mm-hmm. He talks about that whole idea of overwhelm. There's only two things. There's only two areas like where conflict comes from, or in your brain, like your internal conflict. That's basically overwhelm. And abandonment. Those are like the only two things. Oh, Everything gosh, stemmed from that. Abandonment. Shit. Yeah. So like basically you're either feeling like overwhelmed by the world or you're just feeling abandoned. So, you know, like I'm like, wow, I never th- heard it put that way. Hmm. And then he like kind of plays it out through the story, like of like that's overwhelmed. Like you're overwhelmed by like your domineering mother, or you're overwhelmed by just society and like, you know, just judgments that are put on you. Yeah. I'm going all over the place. All right. So episode 32, Judgment. (laughs) We will see you next week. See you next week. Take care, everyone.